Welcome everyone. My name is Kristen miller Zone, and I'm the Executive Director of Costume Society of America. We thank you for joining today's edition of our Conversations on Dress series, an oral history interview with Sharon S. Takeda. Please allow me to introduce our interviewer, Clarissa Esquera, Associate Curator of Costume and Textiles at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Clarissa joined the museum in 2008. She received her BFA in Fashion Design and Minor in Gender Studies from Brunel Women's College and her MS in Historic and Cultural Aspects of Dress and Textiles from the University of Georgia with a focus on the history of menswear. She specializes in 18th through 21st century women's and men's fashion and oversees various European costume, tapestry, and textile rotations throughout the permanent, permanent galleries at LACMA. I will turn it over to Clarissa to introduce the subject of today's interview, Sharon S. Takeda. Thank you, Kristen. Um, it is my pleasure to be with everyone today um, and to introduce you to Sharon S. Takeda, who is Senior Curator and Head of the Costume and Textiles Department at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, or LACMA. She joined the curatorial staff in 1987 after receiving her undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of California, Los Angeles, and concluding two years of postgraduate work in Japan under the auspices of the Japanese Ministry of Education. Sharon has an impressive CV of exhibitions, which you will soon hear about, including Raining Men, Fashion and Menswear, 1715 to 2015, Kimono for a Modern Age, Verdarte Fra Angelica Collection, African Textiles and Adornment, Selections from the Marcel and Ziera Mies Collection, Fashion, Fashion, European Dress and Detail, 1700 to 1915, Breaking the Mode, Contemporary Fashion from the Permanent Collection, Miracles and Mischief, No and Kyogen Theater in Japan, and When Art Became Fashion, Kosode and Edo Period, Japan, 1615 to 1868, to name only a few. In addition to numerous exhibition catalogs, some of her publications include Japanese fishermen's coats from Awaji Island for the Fowler Museum at UCLA, Edo, Art in Japan, 1615 to 1868 for the National Gallery of Art, and Maraguchi Konihiko Yuzen Design Crossroads of Creativity for the National Museum of Modern Art, Kyoto. In addition to being awarded a travel fellowship by the Japan Foundation and a travel grant by the Kyoto National Museum to conduct primary research in Japan, Sharon has received two CSA Milia Davenport Publication Awards for When Art Became Fashion and Miracles and Mischief, and two CSA Richard Martin Awards for Excellence in the Exhibition of Costume. Sharon currently serves on the directing council of the Centre International d'Etudes de Textile Ancien, or CETA. Beyond her many accomplishments as a curator, Sharon has mentored countless students and burgeoning curators at every level of our profession, including paid internship initiatives spearheaded by the Getty Institute and the Mellon Foundation to encourage diversity in our field. As someone who has had the great privilege to be mentored by Sharon since 2008 as a curatorial assistant through today as an associate curator, personally, I cannot stress how much I value her leadership, continued encouragement, and friendship. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Sharon S. Takeda. Hello, Sharon. Hi, thank you for that lovely introduction. Almost brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we've um, I've been so lucky to be mentored by you, and um, you really have. I mean, I can just begin this to say that uh, we have a close relationship, as I did begin uh, in the department in the beginning of 2008 as a curatorial assistant. And I can say personally that that changed my life. I moved to Los Angeles, met my husband and child, got my child, and, and I've kind of continued on as a curator. So I'm really touched that I have the um, opportunity to interview you for this CSA oral history. So thank you, Sharon. Now, I thought perhaps we could begin with um, uh, how we started together, um, where we met in 2008, which was this project this big project that you spearheaded with uh, Case Bilker, who is curator emeritus. Uh, what project was, uh, maybe we could talk about this image and, and what that project was. Uh, yes, the image on the left, well, when you first came, I think we hadn't even acquired the Camber Roof collection, which is a yeah. major European collection 
um, 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, actually, of men's, women's, and children's wear. Um, so when you started, um, you know, and we decided once we acquired the, the collection to do an exhibition, um, I made sure you went to every single meeting with me uh, so that you could really understand the museum culture and see how, um, how um, kind of projects uh, evolve. Uh, and so that, that was really wonderful. So these pictures you see right here, are, the one on the left was a, a photo that was in Vogue magazine um, and we're just getting ready to install the show. Um, everything's dressed and we're ready to kind of move pieces in. And then on the right, you see um, yourself as a curatorial assistant, I believe you are at the time, uh, helping, you had great uh, skill in dressing. And so uh, that was really put to task uh, while we were uh, exhibiting or, or putting up this show. And I remember it wasn't until this exhibition was installed that we were actually approached to tour it. Um, yeah, it was when it opened actually, you know, uh, typically a lot of times you, you um, get the um, travel schedule kind of uh, people wanting to take the show beforehand, but this time uh, the, the exhibition was up and uh, one of the curators from Les Arts Decoratifs uh, wanted to um, bring it to Europe. And so then uh, we also got here, uh, the, it first went to the Deutsches Historic Museum in Berlin, where you see the poster outside uh, the building, the museum there, and then this joint picture of us, um, the LACMA team and the Deutsches DHL or DHM team um, in, the, in their IMP um, uh, building. Yeah, and they were so fantastic to work with. Um, and while we were there um, installing the exhibition, you were also looking at uh, collections in, um, uh, in, in Paris. Um, and uh, you actually took me to my very first trip to Paris. Um, I, I was so excited and you can really see the excitement in my face in this picture as we were walking. Um, uh, around Place Vendôme, me for the first time. <laughs> I think it wasn't until we were in the midst of, of installing the exhibition, which typically takes us for a major costume show uh, a month to install, you know, from beginning to opening date. And I think it was in there, you know, that all of a sudden, you know, I was asked to come to Paris to look at a private collection. And so I thought that I would, it would be great to bring you along um, as well. And so I, I love it that I, was the first to show you Paris. Yeah, and you showed me Paris really well. You said we have to go here, 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 and it, and I, and I have those lasting, really lovely memories. Um, and and uh, while I we were touring Raining Men, you had promoted me as uh, an assistant curator, and um, the very first task you gave me was actually to to go to New York and um, visit Betty Kirk, who is um, such an amazing scholar of Madeleine Vionnet and um, to, to work on bringing in the collection to, uh, to LACMA. Um, and we're really lucky to help, uh, to receive the help of MB Sonnet with this as well. Right, I thought, you know, you were the perfect person um, to go. And, um, you know, I learned of Betty's uh, archive through um, June Kanai, a friend who, um, told me that Betty really wanted to find a, a, a good home for her archives. And so then I put you on the task um, because of your pattern making expertise and that you would really enjoy that. Uh, so you went out uh, to visit Betty when she was still in her home. And then the entire archive um, came to LACMA where it is today. And these are photographs when Betty had moved to Los Angeles or Southern California. And we invited her into talk to her about uh, her twalls, uh, which are very popular and accessible. I know that, you know, both Raf Simmons and John Galliano, while they were each at Dior, uh, came in and viewed it as other designers have as well, so. Yeah, that's such an amazing resource and so happy to have met and had that time with Betty. Yeah, she's such a legend. Yeah, she really is. Um, and then here's a picture of us at, uh, the Dean Stahl at Les Arts Decoratifs, uh, finally saying goodbye to um, fashioning fashion. And, you know, reflecting about 
this um, image, I I thought about all the um, all of the dinners and times that we sp spent together <laughs> touring the show internationally, um, and that was really when I grew to really understand your history and how you came to be the curator that you are at LACMA. So I thought maybe this might be a good transition to um, start at the very beginning of the Sharon Takeda origin story. Um, and I have a really lovely image of Sharon, baby Sharon. I Though this is on Zoom, I, I, uh, um, in a virtual format, I, I, I feel a collective awe from uh, <laughs> everyone watching because this is the best adorable picture of you um so could you sausage arms and <laughs> I love sausage arms um could you please uh tell us a little bit about where you grew up and your history yeah um I'm a third generation Japanese American who was born and raised in the rural town of Hanford California uh, which is located halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, when my paternal grandmother who lived with us uh, was told that her second grandchild was a girl, she supposedly voiced um, disappointment because I was a girl, which would not be very helpful on the large family farm that raised walnuts, peaches, plums, apricots, and cotton. Uh, what was it like growing up in rural uh, Central California? You know, it was really great. I mean, to grow up um, on a large farm and see the horizon and see the sunsets, and then also on clear days see the snow-capped Sierra Mountains. Um, but as a child, I was really, um, you know, as you as you see in this picture, I was I played with, with dolls, but I was really happiest running around the farm, climbing trees and channeling Annie Oakley. And here you can see me in my Annie Oakley outfit, um, accessorized with white rubber galoshes, rain galoshes, instead of cowboy or cowgirl boots. Um, but that was, um, that was me, you know, both um, being a girl, but also really a tomboy on a farm. That's such a fantastic image. Um, and, you know, uh, you are a Japanese American. Was there much of a Japanese American community in Hanford? Um, less than what there was before World War II and in, internment camps, but um, but nonetheless, um, and you know, we, I lived on a farm, so it wasn't, uh, I didn't have close neighbors necessarily, so it was really entertaining myself. Um, but there was a sprinkling of Japanese culture, you know, uh, throughout my childhood for my family. And because my birthday occurs the same week as Girls' Day in Japan, my maternal grandmother um, gifted me every year for the first like five or six years of my life. Um, a doll, a, a tier of the traditional doll, girl, um, Girls' Day doll collections that celebrates the Japanese imperial court during the Han period. Um, and then in addition, you know, every, it seemed like every Christmas throughout grammar school, I would be dressed up as the, probably the only Asian or Japanese, um, I would be dressed up in a kimono, as you see here, to represent Japan in the annual Christmas Around the World program. <laughs> Um, at my grammar school, and besides being very unforgettable or or just uh, memorable, just because of how uncomfortable it felt to me as an American girl, um, I remember my obi sash would always come up, come undone as I ran around, you know, after the program with my Dutch, Portuguese, and Italian American uh, school friends. Wow. And this one, um, this is a photograph, you know, I, as I said, I was, I was kind of a typical American kid as really my parents who were second generations were, I, I think were really also very American in their growing up in, in their um, childhood. Um, but um, I was this American kid enjoying my family's post-war American dream. And like everyone around the world, we marveled at Sputnik, uh, the first satellite to orbit Earth and celebrated that important scientific accomplishment uh, in this photograph with a Sputnik inspired um, Christmas decoration that my mother made from a styrofoam ball and uh, Christmas bulbs and cattails. I love um, that so much. <laughs> uh, but my parents are great. They, they constantly stress, you know, the importance of education and going to college. Um, they thought that becoming a school teacher or a pharmacist were good 
careers or career choices for a girl. So therefore, um, off I went to UCLA as a pre-pharmacy major. Wow, pre-pharmacy major at UCLA. I know, taking those, all those pre-med courses with <laughs> everyone else. <Wow. laughs> um, yeah, and so at UCLA, you know, where the number of students was twice the population of my hometown, um, I enjoyed all that Los Angeles, my mother's hometown had to offer. And in spite of my initial intention of transferring to the University of California at Berkeley, my father's alma mater, um, in my junior year, I, I remained at UCLA. And it was during, it, and it was really during the first semester at UCLA that a friend asked me if my parents had been amongst the more than 100,000 Japanese Americans interned in relocation camps during World War II. And, um, which you see an example of, um, I think this is Jerome, Arkansas on the right, uh, where my parents and grandparents were interned. Um, so, and it was, you know, I had no idea. Uh, they never talked about it. Uh, and it was only um, when my first time going home after I, in my freshman year, which was Thanksgiving, and I, I went home and I said, what's this about? internment camps. And then they just totally opened up and told me all sorts of stories, um, you know, and it was really to them, it was, there's a Japanese girl um, saying, Shigata Ganai, it couldn't be helped. But what they did do was come back. And, and luckily my father's family um, had property to come back to because friends in the small town watched over uh, the property and the business property. Um, so, uh, but they really resorted themselves to, you know, which is part of the reason I think we didn't, the third generation Japanese Americans lost the mother tongue because mm -hmm. when our parents came back, our grandparents and parents came back, um, you know, they didn't really, they wanted to blend in and they wanted yeah. to become good citizens. Um, and uh, so that's why, um, but some of the stories my parents told me about relocation, they brought out photographs and they said, yes, wow. you know, the government didn't know what Japanese people ate, so, but they knew that they liked rice and sweet things. So they said that their first meal was canned peaches on rice. Oh my gosh. But that was why, that's when they knew that, that the internees, you know, had, in, had to um, take control of the kitchen, which they did. <laughs> <laughs> and Sharon, your, your parents, they met in the internment camp too, right? Yeah, they did. They met in internment camp and they actually um, got out a bit early as a lot of young people, you know, who were able to find jobs um, kind of not on the coast, but in internal, you know, so my parents actually got jobs in Chicago, got out early before their parents and um, uh, moved to Chicago where they each separately, you know, got jobs and that's where they courted. Wow, what a story, Sharon. So then um, after this huge revelation, you, you went back to UCLA and continued on with your with your pharmacy, pre-pharmacy education. Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> yeah, luckily <laughs> I was in, yeah, pre-pharmacy, calculus, all of that. Um, um, but luckily at UCLA, you know, my liberal arts education required um, that I take elective courses. So, uh, which is where I discovered art history, art, art and art history actually. And um, I was inspired by a integrated arts course that was taught by a Dr. Kaiser, a lecturer um, and his course tracked history through architecture, art, music and dance. Um, and I just totally, he was a fabulous lecturer and he was very impressive And that, you know, his course really changed my life or the course of what I wanted to do. Because um, of course, as a, you know, as a high school student, I was always college prep and I didn't take any art courses, I think until my last semester of high school. So, um, you know, so what happened is that I was so, I fell so in love with art and art history that I changed my major to art and design and then began to start saving money uh, so that I could take my first trip to Europe to visit museums. And that's a that's a picture of you. Uh, yes, this is me <laughs> in my artistic beret <laughs> on top of the ivory, uh, Eiffel Tower. And um, the one thing that I 
was so impressive at the time. It was, um, again, my first trip to Europe and just going through the Louvre and, and all the other huge museums. And um, the first big aha moment was like, you know, when you take your art history class and you're seeing those slides on the screen, they're all the same size. But then when you get to the Louvre, it's like, oh my gosh, the, you know, um, this famous painting is much smaller than what I thought it was be. And this painting is, is huge, you know? So, so that was really fun to kind of, you know, be startled by not only the size, but really um, to see a lot, all those famous paintings up close. <laughs> and, you know, how did your parents um, react to you changing your major from pre-pharmacy to art? Well, I, you know, I think they were um, surprised, you know, because I was never really, I didn't, you know, maybe like some other kids, I really didn't show that artistic side maybe, or, you know, I wasn't a drawer, you know, avid drawer. Um, but they, I think they, you know, they really supported me and trusted, you know, and if it was what I was really passionate about, then, then that was fine with them. That's great. And here we have uh, actually an example of, of a piece that you made. <laughs> yeah, this is after earning my bachelor's degree, I, you know, I worked a year in as a fashion illustrator in downtown Los Angeles before deciding to return back to UCLA uh, for graduate school. Um, fiber art at the time was a new exciting medium. And so I focused on creating architecturally scaled fiber art. Um, and after receiving my master's degree, I, I was a practicing fiber uh, artist. Uh, this is a black and white photo um, of an eight by 12 foot uh, commission that took me months to hand dye and construct by hand um, without a loom. Um, and after uh, being in that for a while, you know, where it's doing these extremely large commissions, um, you know, I started feeling like, well, it's it's 10% inspiration or making, you know, the artistic design. And then it was, you know, 90%, you know, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, you know, dying in garbage, bin, huge garbage bins and spending so much time um, and then sending them off. Um, and I also saw that it wasn't, uh, fiber art wasn't, didn't have the, the structure that traditional arts such as paintings, sculpture, um, got in terms of a, a, a robust gallery system and collectors and museums actively collecting it. You know, we were, most of us were doing commissions and teaching. Um, so um, I decided at one point to um, start to switch mediums and go into, so I experimented with encaustic paintings. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it, I was really challenged um, to search what I really wanted to say. Um, you know, it wasn't just being a craftsman anymore, it was being an artist. Um, and during that process, I had an identity crisis. It's like, who was I? What and what did I want to express with my painting? Um, why was I an Asian born into a primarily Caucasian society? Um, I was also embarrassed that I had lost my knowledge of high school German and uh, college Italian languages, um, while my European friends um, spoke up to five languages. So um, it was really at that time that I decided to go in search of, of myself and who I was. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. It's your, so in a sense, your art practice is what ultimately led you to Japan. Uh, yeah, so I first started studying um, the Japanese language because, of course, I didn't grow up learning it because, as I mentioned, um, a lot of us third generation Japanese Americans were not taught the mother tongue. Um, and so I first started the language and then I uh, applied for this as a research scholar uh, with um, that gave me two years of, of kind of um, research grant uh, to spend in Japan. And I wanted to specifically, I chose specifically to learn about a traditional um, Raimi textile, which is um, where the thread is made during the summer, spun by hand during the summer as fine as hair, 
and then in the winter when the um, snow is up to the rooftops in Niigata Prefecture, um, women um, were stayed with the children indoors while the men went off to the Edo, the capital, to find work in this agrarian society and um, spent time weaving this incredibly fine Raimi um, cloth and also, which are also ecot dyed. And then in the spring, it's snow bleached. Uh, and that's, this is the, the photo of, you know, all the um, weavings that were done during that winter uh, were taken out on a sunny day when there's still a meter of snow on the ground, but the sun um, is constantly shining or shining every day. And so what happens is that the um, sun melts the snow, which, is, which releases ions or um, ozone, which then helps to kind of change the natural cloth of Ramey, which is like a natural hemp uh, color to pure white within seven to 10 days. So I, I really, you know, did field work in Niigata Prefecture, although I was based, um, my academic studies and research was at the Kanazawa Art University or University of Art. Um, uh, but then in Niigata, I actually uh, learned to dye and weave and, and wove an obi length uh, version of this cloth on a backstrap loom in the middle of winter when the snow was up to the rooftops. Um, and then while I was there, UCLA Education Department commissioned me to direct and produce a video um, that was funded by the Japan Foundation and the Regents of University of California. Wow, yes, and there you are with your camera um, documenting the snow bleaching. What an experience. Yeah, it was really wonderful. Um, and so, so after this amazing field research uh, experience, how did you make your way to LACMA? So I returned um, back to Los Angeles and I, you know, before I was trying to figure out what to do, what, you know, whether to continue as an artist or to really, at that point I was really starting to think about museum work and what, how I might go about that. Um, and, um, you know, I presented my research paper on the snow bleaching cloth to a group, a small local group of, of textile historians which included LACMA um, curators at the time. Uh, and they were impressed with my research and my talk and they invited me to volunteer uh, in the costume and textile department where my first assignment was cataloging Indonesian textiles. Um, and I think it was, um, you know, because I knew how to make things or how things were made both from the thread making to the dyeing to the weaving, I was really able to describe um, you know, and these are times when it was before computer databases, so it was really you were hand typing, you know, library cards, you know, and describing things so that if for some reason the identification tag got away from it, if you read the description of the piece, you would be able to connect the piece with, with the number, the correct number and the cataloging card. Um, so. So that was great. And then um, soon after I started volunteering, there was um, the assistant, then assistant curator from the Tokyo National Museum um, visited LACMA and I had the privilege of reviewing with him and getting to know LACMA's Japanese, historic Japanese textile collection alongside with him. Um, and he was very thankful that I knew Japanese and it would be helpful. And then I was very thankful for learning about not about sort of uh, rural um, folk textiles, but really high-end high um, silk, more aristocratic or samurai class um, textiles uh, and, and learning about motifs and the meaning of motifs. So that was really a great education to sit by somebody like that and, and um, see what he was excited in and, or be excited on something together. And, and, and that's when I knew that the museum collections were typically more aristocratic or high-end because they were gifted by, mm -hmm. you know, um, heiresses and, you know, banking heiresses and whoever who traveled the world at that time and traveled to Japan. And this is what they collected. Mm -hmm. And uh, this research um, would soon become the basis of, of this exhibition. 
Yeah, it was it was the meeting of the of the curator from the Tokyo National Museum who was so thankful for all the help he received and invited me and um, my coworker, co you know, became co-curator Dale Gluckman to go to Japan. And um, he helped us get entree into not only museum collections, but also private collections and private corporate collections, you know, mm -hmm. of of companies that had been in business since the Edo period, since the 18th century. Um, and we were able, because we were foreigners, able to somehow get to see things that even he, as a Japanese in the Tokyo National Museum, was not allowed to see. Um, and so we were able to share that. And then, and then he came up with it, or maybe we all came up with the idea of doing a major show on uh, Edo period Kosode because um, most of the major museums in America have these and also famous collectors like Frank Lloyd Wright and others and all the, like I say, banking heiresses or, or collections at RISD. Um, and so we decided to do this together with another colleague from the National Museum of, of Japanese History. And, you know, after this exhibition and book were uh, produced, and up it won, I should mention, um, the catalog won seven national awards, including uh, Costume Society of America's M Mila Davenport Award. Um, and after the success of this exhibition, you went on to curate several more important exhibition, which had, exhibitions, which I'd love to go through. Um, you know, you spoke about uh, uh, folk Japanese uh, textiles and, um, and then here is a fabric of life with a, such a graphic piece. Can you talk about a the show a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think again, this you know I, I wanted to see what kinds of folk textile, Japanese folk textiles were in Lacmas collections, of which there there were a few, uh, including this Ainu robe. Um, and so uh, so I decided within the in our Pavilion for Japanese Art, which you'll see a photograph of later, um, to do an exhibition solely on textiles. And I used it as an exercise to do the research of pieces in our collections and also to find out what local collectors were collecting in this area. So this was you know, a show of maybe about 35 pieces. Um, you know, and and categorized by either regional area or by uh, motifs uh, or or techniques, really. Um, and so I was really inspired and wanted to learn more about the Minge movement or the Japanese folk art movement, and then um, this idea of the unknown craftsman. I think also I was appealed. What appealed me, uh, I think, to the the folk art movement was this that it was craft and it was about unknown craftsmen, but also what led me to Japan earlier too was the fact that unlike here at the time where craftsmen, crafts and art, there was always this kind of controversial or fight where the cra where fiber artists or textile artists would fight for, well, this is like art and we should be considered artists. And in Japan, craft, many crafts, you know, of course are revered and are considered art and command the same, if not more, um, higher prices than than um, other contemporary art too. So, um, so anyway, it was a great exercise, and it really also showed how textiles uh, could really look beautiful in the in the pavilion for Japanese art, where normally uh, we display um, folding screens and hanging scrolls. Oh, that's a great perspective. Um... And you became uh, head of the department uh, during uh, the uh, R&D phase of this really important exhibition. Um, can you talk about this show a little bit? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Fabric of Life was kind of a small show. Obviously, I was, um, I really, Japanese textiles was my passion. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, had immediately wanted to do another large um, international loan exhibition uh, to kind of really get more involved or, or give me reason to travel to Japan and to do research and to meet and work with my colleagues. Um, so uh, I decided to do the No and Kyogen Theater in Japan, 
LACMA does not have a big collection in this area. Um, and, you know, we were, LACMA was a small regional museum at that time. Yes, we were the largest museum west of the Mississippi, but, you know, our collections, you know, we don't, we don't have large acquisition endowments. So, so, you know, when I first started, a lot of the cur us curators were doing major international loan exhibitions and then using that as a vehicle to show a few maybe pieces that we have already in the collection, but also to um, use it as a, a reason or a uh, justification for finding world-class pieces. And so this piece that is shown here is a beautiful karaori, um, you know, uh, 18th century karaori, which is a, um, you know, silk twill with, with um, silk and gold th supplementary weft patterning. And it had, uh, during the R&D, it came up um, for auction where uh, from a very famous um, samurai um, or samurai family um, or industrial family, uh, the Itamitsu Art Museum uh, were selling off their textiles. Uh, and so we were able to get a couple pieces, including this amazing 18th century um, robe with um, snow covered camellias and golden clouds. Fantastic. And that is a stunning piece. This is the, the uh, front and back cover of the <laughs> exhibition catalog because it was not only textiles, but it included masks from the 14th, 15th century, uh, you know, and uh, musical instruments, musical scores, paintings. It actually had uh, uh, spinning and weaving uh, implements as well. Um, and it had, um, you know, we got the top, or I was able to get the top mass specialists and my textile colleagues at the two national museums and others um, who, were, who were experts in performance, no performance, um, to write, um, you know, the, the catalog or write specific chapters for the catalog. And the catalog uh, was awarded the Mila Davenport Publication Award and then the exhibition also uh, was awarded the Richard Martin Award too. Um, now you do make a shift with this exhibition, Breaking the Mode, um, highlighting contemporary fashion from the permanent collection. How did you go, how did you make this shift from organizing um, really Japanese centered exhibitions to something um, about contemporary fashion? Well, once I was asked to, to become head of the department and our department is not just fashion, it's, you know, it's textiles and fashion and it's encyclopedic, all cultures, all time periods. You know, so all of a sudden I had to really like look at and steward the collection I was responsible for. And at the same time, maybe it was because I was in Japan, you know, at the height of the Japanese craze with, you know, Issey Miyake and Reika Kubo and Yoji um, and saw that happening in Japan. When I came back um, and when I became head, you know, I just started, or maybe even before I became, started really collecting um, some of this material uh, because I knew it wasn't in our collection. And together with my colleague, Kay Spilker, um, you know, who was, all, who was into Martin Margiela at the time, we, we really, for not that much money actually, because we were finding a lot of the Issei Miyake things in secondhand um, stores, um, you know, and then we gradually, you know, started purchasing things as well. And so we had been doing this just sort of like, this is what our collection needs. It's, it's a gap that needs to be filled. It's really important. It, and it really is pieces that really were obviously that they should be in an art museum context. So, and then what happened was that when our current director, Michael Govan came and I knew that he was coming, he was gonna be a director and he was then director of the DIA Foundation in New York City and his whole, he had, you know, worked at the Guggenheim and and um, kind of helped to establish Bilbao, that that um, we and I told Kay I said this is the time that we have to put together this exhibition because Michael Govan is coming. This is contemporary, so we put it together very quickly, um, and it was all from our permanent collection. 
And I remember, you know, one of the first receptions, Michael, you know, m made the comment to the to the group that it was like, I just saw Breaking the Mode and it has more ideas per square foot than any show I've ever seen. So that was really wonderful, you know, to hear that from a director, from your new director who actually could appreciate, you know, um, yeah. not only for his insight and his, you know, uh, but that he could appreciate uh, textiles and fashion. As art equal in, in our art. encyclopedic yeah. art museum. Yeah. Um, now we have some fantastic images from this exhibition that we could kind of just cycle through. Yeah, through this pretty quickly here. It, it's, um, you know, this is, uh, it was divided into four thematic section. The first slide uh, we just saw was about kind of the changing uh, form or, or uh, silhouette. And then we went into construction and some of the examples here are this Ray Kawakubo deconstructed jacket. On the right, it was um, this is one of Kay's favorite pieces. It was it's a simple dress, but the the lining is twisted inside, um, which you see uh, in the detail you're seeing up into the into the dress uh, to give it form that kind of holds you know whatever shape you want it to manipulate it into. So good. And then we looked at materials. So these are a couple of examples. Um, for example, the man in gray, which is a uh, you know silk uh, jersey knit that was pleated into this gown. And then you have Issey Miyake, who was doing pleating, but doing it with polyester, you know, heat set pleating. Um, and so it was that kind of fabulous thing where we were highlighting highlighting fashion designers who were really breaking the mode, really going mm -hmm. out, you know, and being experimental. And I love these juxtapositions. And then another thematic section was form. And we had both, you know, semi-historic with Gilbert Adrian's 1951 um, dress that is obviously referencing 18th century pannier dresses. And then uh, on the extreme was, um, you know, Issey Miyake's zigzag dress um, yeah. that, you know, it's shown here flat, but it, it kind of, again, shows different materials and different ways uh, of tailoring or, or in Issa's case, where the, where the fabric does the tailoring for you, or certainly the texture, yeah. And then the final was concept. So we were looking at various uh, things of concept and here's just the trench, uh, the trench coat uh, section, which showed how, uh, contemporary fashion designers were kind of deconstructing the traditional trench coat. So you have Christopher Bailey was it for Burberry kind of mm -hmm. doing a cropped Burberry jacket. And then you have Junio Atanabe for Comme de Garçons kind of moving the, the um, trench coat belt up to uh, kind of closer to the shoulders. And it's hard to see, but the skirt is totally made of trench coat collars that create this whole shape, uh, new shape. Um, and then Martin Margiela, who is a master of deconstruction, who with a trench coat that's kind of finished on one side and then appears to just be dissolving on the other. And this show marked the beginning of international tours of costume and textile organized exhibitions from, from LACMA. Um, yeah, I think first of all, it was, you know, all, it's 100% uh, LACMA's collection. And again, you know, once it opened, uh, we were approached by the Palazzo Strozzi in Florence, Italy uh, to, uh, to take it, travel it there. And beca because of that support, we were able um, to uh, have a publication because not all of our exhibitions or, uh, you know, were, did have uh, exhibition catalogs. So we did the Breaking the Mode uh, catalog. Um, and uh, so that was really great. It, it, the exhibition also traveled to the Indianapolis Art Museum. And it was when you were traveling to Indianapolis is about when I started. Um, and then uh, we moved into this, this exhibition, Fashioning Fashion. Yeah, so Fashioning Fashion after, you know, I think we did, this was also fast track. So I think we put it together and maybe, I mean, I think Kosode took, six years, you know, typically major international long shows take about five, five or six years in those days. And then, um, you know, 
breaking the mode was we really put together quickly. I can't even remember how fast that was. And then with the acquisition, a major acquisition of, of this collection, um, we really wanted to put it out there once we finally uh, were successful in uh, fundraising for it. Yeah, because the curator's job is not only to exhibit, but to collect and fundraise. And this was a pretty landmark acquisition. Um, pretty heavy lift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Many years um, of fundraising from you. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it was one of those things where, um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, I was at an international conference and I met um, and I was speaking to Wolfgang Wolf, who's on the far right here, um, who was is one of the major um, fashion dealers of European, you know, uh, at the time it's sold to, of course, the Med, Kyoto Costume Institute and whatever. And I asked him, I was looking for something that I needed to present to a major acquisition group. And he said, well, does it have to be one object? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, why this collection? And I was like, well, you know, which is way beyond what I was looking for at the time. But I said, I'm the type that just like, okay, yeah, show it to me. You know what, I'll send you a disc. So he showed it to me. He sent it to me. I immediately took the disc and handed it over to um, a couple of um, younger staff who had at that time who had, you know, had come from the Met or done done um, work with with the Costume Institute at the Met, and I said, "Take a look at this and tell me what you think." And they came back with their mouths open and said, "Oh my God, you know there are things here that are so rare." And then for me, looking at it, this was my second trip. This photo, which was taken by Michael Govan, um, which is when we went um, and with potential donor, uh, you know, uh, particularly. Uh, to view the collection, but I had been to this cold warehouse, Freeport warehouse in Basel, Switzerland, where the collection was stored earlier um, with Melinda Kirstein, who was then our uh, collections manager, to, to go look at every object and look at condition. Um, yeah. And I think, um, yeah, so, so here we are with Martin Kammer on the, on the left, Wolfgang Ruf, um, you see Ellen Michelson behind, who's a major, um, uh, and continuing to, you know, make support us and has become a friend. Um, and Vicki Steele on, on the left, looking at um, this collection. Uh, and it was really, um, yeah, it took us probably three or four years to raise the very high price. It was a, a kind of a um, groundbreaking um, purchase for us. And, you know, we had to go out and raise, um, because of Ellen's initial support, we were able to kind of have the confidence that we could, we could, and with Michael's um, kind of um, also support, we were able to kind of put it together. Yeah, and I mean, it, this sex, this collection is incredible. It was the first project you gave me when I first started, and I couldn't believe that I had the opportunity. Um, but I, you know, I came from um, you know a specialization in European dress. And, and your specialization is in, in Japanese textiles. And um, what was it that drew you to really work hard to acquire this collection? Yeah, I, I, like I said, I wasn't really a costume historian, but, but what really drew me when I was looking at it, you know, the first time and looking inside and out and just talking with it with Martin and Wolfgang were the textiles, the fabulous textiles yeah. and, and the way the interiors, the way things were, were, um, were um, made. So. So then we quickly acquired this and decided and were uh, in, invited to be one of the three major um, major exhibitions that opened the Linda and Stuart Resnick Exhibition Pavilion. Um, and so that was great. And then um, the next slide shows um, the installation, which was uh, designed by Pier Luigi Pizzi, the uh, Italian opera opera director and set and costume designer. And um, his concept was that this was a new collection and they were coming out of their crates. Of course, it took much more time than that to do it. Uh, but this is a timeline section, you know, where we decided to show the changing silhouette just with white or off white material. And then behind it, you go around the corner and you see um, the men's timeline. And um, and then we decided to do that with color, and you know, to kind of put away that whole 
you know, Mifit men just wore gray flannel suits. So that was lovely. And that was the precursor for reigning men. Yeah. And then because the collection, uh, the Cayman Roof collection included so, was so rich in menswear that we decided we had enough to do a real, um, you know, menswear, menswear um, exhibition, but it took a while to, you know, it, we were so busy with this and other things in between. So then um, the other quickly, you know, were textile, the textile section, and here's a man's banyan made of Chinese um, silk, and then the um, tailoring section, and I know this is one of your favorites, this my favorite too, but one of your favorites with the beret sleeve. Sleeve is incredible. Um, yeah, and then um, trim, and again, this is um, that same dress we were looking at examining with um, with Martin and Wolfgang in the previous slides um, and shows you the great, uh, the amazing, amazing. And we're still, we're still mining this and using it, yeah. you know, uh, in various collections. Or yeah, exhibitions. absolutely. Um, the next exhibition you did was uh, Rodarte um, and uh, Fra Angelica collection. And you yeah. can talk about oh, how you yeah. approached this. Yeah, it was about the time that uh, Fashion Fashion was um, winding down and and uh, Kate and Laura, you know, came to us and said that they had this project that they had uh, premiered in um, Piti Uomo, I believe it was, in Florence. And so uh, they sent me images and whatever and they, they wanted to gift it to LACMA, um, uh, they themselves and also a lot of their supporters. And so I felt like, wow, this is an amazing collection. Um, but of course, and wanted to highlight it as we do with a lot of our, you know, as we build a collection and kind of honor the gift or the purchase to do an exhibition. So I decided I wanted to do a pop-up exhibition. But of course, you know, um, we the museum doesn't work that way. The schedule goes, you know, three or five years in advance. Um, but I decided that, and I proposed to Michael and the European curator that, to have this pop-up exhibition within our Florentine galleries. And once it was up, you could just see, even in this, you know, partial picture photo of the gallery, how, how Kate and Laura really channeled uh, the collections, the, the, the colors of Florentine art. It really, those pieces really activated that gallery in a way that we hadn't seen before. I would say too. Right. And then this is the pavilion for Japanese art I was talking to you about before where um, I had done the fabric of um, life collection um, exhibition and the next slide um, shows kind of the interior, um, which is very challenging. Again, it's, it was designed <laughs> to display folding screens and hanging scrolls, um, but you can see how fabulous textiles look in it. And so this is I'd been collecting um, some of these modern kimonos, uh, kind of um, 19th century when Japan was turning over to in industrialization, both with spinning, uh, modern spinning um, mills and also, um, I, also chemical dyes. And so again, it, it was this time where it was I think it was time when the Texas Society of America was gonna meet in Los Angeles. So I said, well, this is the perfect time to put this on display. So I was able to get the whole uh, East galleries and highlight some of these amazing mesa and kimono that are made of, of machine spun silk and are, are have um, kind of hand uh, printed uh, warp and warp weft or warp and weft designs and often inspired by Western art um, movements. Uh, you can see here, it looks very much like um, uh, Art Deco, but it also, in some ways, as I look at this more, um, also looks at really uh, early Edo period uh, designs as well, but in a very abstract way. And there's great detail on the right where, you know, they're trying to print these threads before weaving as a shortcut, but that's still really <laughs> quite extraordinary. Right. And then Raining Men, we finally got around to doing Raining Men. Um, and, uh, you know, we should probably move along here because I think we're yeah. running out of time. But um, so this was really looking at the the evolution and revolution of, of menswear. 
uh, 300 years of menswear. And this is the, the first room of revolution, evolution. And it also included, you know, um, East West and um, the body and, and, and just over the top. But one of the, again, the main, you know, during the R&D of this is when this amazing rare zoot suit came up at auction. Um, and we just had to have it um, for our, um, for the show, it was perfect timing. And so we were able to, to get that uh, successfully. That exciting day when that happened. That was a really exciting day. <laughs> and here we are at the opening celebrating together the team. Yeah, I think again, it shows you that it takes a village to put up a, a, a major fashion exhibition. And so this is, you know, our c &T team at the time. And, um, you know, finally uh, experiencing the opening together. And then it also traveled to um, the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, Australia, as well as the St. Louis um, Art Museum. Um, and we are, you know, uh, now in present day. So we're kind of coming to the end of this presentation, but wanted to highlight some of the things you're working on now, Sharon. Yeah, so as many of you know, we're, we're currently um, uh, building uh, this amazing um, uh, Peter Zumthor design um, uh, building that is going to be called the Geffen Galleries. And it was during the beginning of lockdown, ever since we locked down uh, two years ago, we've been already working on all the, the installations for this. Um, we made 15, our department only made, you know, uh, 15 proposals at the time in a very short order within a month or so. And then those are now honing down and or honing in. And we now have, um, you know, when the building opens, uh, Costume and Textiles will have five, I counted them five individual exhibitions. Um, and also uh, we're being encouraged to collaborate with our colleagues in, in our other curatorial departments and, and our team is working with on nine other uh, installations and, and exhibitions uh, for the opening. And this is all in addition to the five major costume and textile exhibitions that will be in the resident pavilion um, that are in the pipeline um, and, you know, and starting with opening next month. Um, so anyway, and here you see, you know, some of the pieces that will be in there, some for the first time or very rare. This is a man's formal court robe from China, 18th century. Uh, it's the only um, court robe of its kind outside of the Palace Museum in Beijing. Uh, so this was a major uh, purchase as well as this collection of um, ceremonial kuba cloth um, pieces. And also, um, quickly, because I know we're running short, um, you know, also had the opportunity to um, to bring in um, five um, major African American quilts, uh, as you see here. And so, so yeah. some of these will be um, the Chinese row will be in a gallery all by itself, and then I'm going to be doing an African show that will highlight some of the Cuba as well as Mubuti and um, some of these quilts. And then further down the line, we have, um, you know, we're working on a 20th and early 21st century exhibition and filling the holes and the gaps in our collection uh, with, uh, and this is one that has not, that will debut in that exhibition. This beautiful Coco Chanel spring summer 1930 dress. And then a most recent, um, uh, acquisition of a piece by Jamie Okuma, um, who celebrates her her Native American heritage. And the yoke of this um, amazing coat was actually beading that she had done for a dancing skirt for herself as a child or when or maybe a teenager, and then decided to put it um, incorporated into this coat, uh, which is also embellished with um, German brooches along the collar and purple conch shells. Um, below her beading. And then the front side, um, you know, is, is channeling other traditional, a um, reverse applique uh, technique that's done by um, other Native American tribes. It's amazing. I, a lot always continuing to go on in our department and especially under your leadership. So thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing all of this. Um, we have a, a, just a little bit of time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, 
open the chat to see uh, what kind of questions we have. Um, so uh, from, from Cassidy Clare, hello. Uh, she asks, looking back over your incredible, incredible career, are there any moments that punctuated as particularly significant or even surprising that you would be willing to share? And, or what are some of your favorite textile and dress pieces in the LACMA collection? Oh my gosh, it's hard to choose favorites no, now. Like, There's so many, um, no. you know. Um, so, I mean, I think that, I mean, I always loved fashion growing up, I think. I sewed my own clothes. Um, but I, you know, like I said, the idea of becoming a curator was just, I, you know, and I think my parents, even after I became a curator and they saw some of my shows, didn't know what a curator did or does, you know. And so I think the biggest surprise was this amazing um, opportunity that I received um, to become a member of LACMA's team um, and to head this department and to build, you know, to, to train future, hopefully future curators and to mentor, you know, my wonderful staff like Clarissa, um, you know, so that that all of these uh, amazing collections, and, and I think it's kind of a magic moment because we have a, a very supportive director, um, you know, and, and we've learned to fundraise and, and that we constantly, that's part of it. I mean, not only does a curator at LACMA have to have the academic chops, but um, we also have to have hand techniques and mm -hmm. know how things are made and really be able to uh, technically analyze a textile to let you know that it's made in China for the Western market or even narrow down the, the dating um, of the garment because of the textile. And we've done that with colleagues where we've helped an American art curator colleague uh, narrow the dating of a painting by the way a men's neckwear was tied. Um, so I, but I think it's really the, um, you know, I feel so fortunate um, and so honored to kind of being able to steward this and to steward the next generations and really um, also, you know, Kay and I, I think really to elevate costume and textiles within an art museum context. And we certainly know now that fashion is that. So, so one of my, some one of my next future projects is to kind of do the same for textiles itself. Yeah. Know, to elevate that where it's like, oh man, this, yeah, of course. And you could see even with the African American quilts, it's sort of like that's improvisational design, like, and patterning right. and drawing that that, you know, contemporary artists do. So, so I hope I answered that question. Yeah. No, that was. That's great, Sharon. Um, I, and I have a question for you. Um, how do you feel your lived experiences influence your curatorial practices? Well, I think I think certainly living abroad mm -hmm. was important. You know, it, it's both um, you know not to not be the ugly American in in a foreign country, um, to really learn the language, to really learn the culture, just start dreaming in that language and to really have um, kind of the opportunity to um, meet colleagues there and that have become lifelong friends or, you know, and, and just to, um, I think that is really something where you learn, it's tough, you learn to be strong, you also learn how to look, you learn how to communicate you learn how to negotiate, uh, you know, as well as publish and continue to lecture. So, so I think that that living abroad, I think more Americans should, I don't know at this particular time, but should mm -hmm. learn to 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 experience a different culture where they feel uncomfortable, where they 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 are put in other shoes, and see it from that angle, and and then to really be, to really, um, you know promote understanding and sharing of, you know, which are really common values, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And to be sensitive to how people think or how you interpret things. Um, and I, I do think that um, hands-on experience is important, particularly in a museum, 
um, and I think I told you this once, it's like, you did. we were Very editing good. Fashion and Fashion, one of your things, and I questioned you. I said, well, you know, about a certain description, and I said, um, and I asked you questions, and I said, you know, I, I know the answer to this, but I want to know what you know, and, then, and I just said, you know, it's like, and it, you answered me, and then I said, listen, I know you know your costume history. You probably know better costume history than I do, but what is this particular object that you're writing about saying? Because you or we have this unique, this unique privilege of having extant historic garments in front of us. You know, we're not studying costume from paintings. You know, we're not. You know, it, we have the actual object there. So, what is that object saying to us? You know, or what can we glean from it? You know, that's different than just the ordinary, whatever. You know, uh, costume history uh, ideas, maybe, or or chronological artist you know, costume history. Yeah, that I remember that um, that time where you said that I think I was trying to write labels for the first time and I carry that with me um, all the time now as I continue to curate my own exhibitions and I'll always appreciate that teaching moment. <laughs> um, so I have uh, one, we probably have time for just one last question. Oh, and this, this comes from Ellen Michelson. Hi, Ellen. Um, could Sharon please share what are the various positions within her costume and textile department and what are the specialties? Yeah, um, hi Ellen. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you've done for us and continue to do for us. Um, okay, so I'm senior curator and department head. And then Clarissa, it, we have two associate curators currently, uh, Clarissa Escara, who you know here, uh, whose specialty you heard in her in um, her introduction. Uh, we have our other associate curator who just joined us just right before lockdown uh, or quarantine is May May Rado, whose specialty is um, basically 18th century French um, fashion, but with, you know, with a lot of Chinese influence and, and stuff like that. And she's currently working on a major show of, of modern uh, Chinese fashion, which you'll learn about when we want you to learn about it more. Um, and then we have Michaela Hansen, um, who, um, you know, started off wanting to be a fashion designer, then, um, you know, studied at RISD and then went to, um, Art is the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she studied under Nick Cave, and uh, but also more importantly, um, interned um, with Gloria Goom, uh, uh, Grimm, our colleague there in, in um, European art, to work on the Impressionism and Fashion Exhibition. And then we brought her in as a paid intern um, when we brought had another big collection, which actually Ellen, you helped fund and actually you supported. Melinda's or, or uh, Michaela's first two paid internships, and she's now a curatorial assistant and is uh, co-curating a major show with with Clarissa right now, which will open next month. Um, and then Nancy Cartioni, who's also listening on this, who um, is my administrative assistant, who came from the former director's office and really helped me during that time when I was really developing in the midst and of doing this major international show of the No and Kyogen Theater. And I needed, I, I actually negotiated her as well as the former curator, uh, Case Bilker's position. Uh, they were part of my negotiations of, of accepting the department <laughs> uh, position. Um, and then we have um, my new research assistant, Ellie Sawada, who um, graduated from Brown in anthropology, just started last fall, and um, has just returned from spending two and a half to three years apprenticing with um, a living national treasure, dyer, natural dyer and weaver in Japan. So that's our tight little group. Um, we also work very closely with collections um, management. management. And, and Melinda, Melinda Kirsten, yeah. yeah, Melinda and Tia. Oh my gosh! So Melinda Kirsten, who was with me when I first viewed the Pamer Roof collection, um, and then she was collections manager at the time, I believe, and then um, then went off because she want, thought she wanted to teach, and then came back because she really missed objects, and so she has become our 
saving grace in terms of um, mounting uh, fashion. And you'll, you'll be seeing this in, in the exhibition that opens next month and, and of which I think LACMA exceeds in our display of dressing. Um, like if you, uh, you know, I, I was hesitant of going into fashion because I didn't want to deal with mannequins, but, but you, know, <laughs> you have to do it. But I must say that, you know, now I, I really come to appreciate it. And it, it's an art in itself. And then working with Melinda is Tia Maroney, who, who is, um, has come up again through kind of a um, position. Well, I think she, she came in as a intern or something while we were packing for our big move out of the of the buildings and um, has now grown in and, and Melinda has been mentoring her uh, in dressing and making invisible mounts. Yeah. And then in addition to that, Rachel too, who I hired as a collection manager is now uh, that department or there's been a new department of collections management and she's now um, the head um, of costume and textile collections management and has her own wonderful team of, of Jen Iacovelli and, and Renea who just started. And then all of us are, are very passionate about um, supporting intern or, or mentoring. Mentoring is a big thing uh, or important to me from the very beginning because I, I felt like I didn't really have that mentorship. And so uh, we're particularly good at it. LACMA is very good about particularly multicultural uh, mentorships and also, um, you know, a whole master's degree in art history program where if you're a full-time employee and you, um, you know, are one of the two LACMA people that get approved for this, you can keep your job. Um, and uh, after three years of art historical, you have to apply to the Arizona State University for your art historic, you know, the art history department and within three years you graduate with an MA and, and you still have your job, your museum job, which is amazing. And that that was Michael Govan's um, great idea. And uh, our first class graduated just this last year, um, the first yeah. class of that. So so that's our very tight ship, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it's really, I feel it's important to mentor uh, a good staff and get it you know, together because, um, you know, that's going to, they, all of you, Clarissa, whatever, you will ensure, you know, that all of the work that Michael Govan and I have done in the past 14 years of building this collection, you know, that it will be in good hands, you know, and it will, you know, it will ensure that, that, uh, you know, you continue to continue in the field, continue uh, contributing to the field, and um, that it will remain a healthy costume and textile department within the Fine Arts Museum. So, Oh, Sharon, that's so touching. <laughs> so I want to thank all my team who are probably on this, you know, that I love you and, and just think you're doing a great job. Yeah, it takes a village. It takes a great team, but it also takes, it takes a, a family, yeah, wonderful and, leader, yeah. too. So um, We're so close. And, we are um, really close. <laughs> If, if people can't tell, we all really, really like each other so much and work together really well. And, and we can't yeah. wait to toast <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> <There's> that. <laughs> the pandemic. Oh my gosh, I know. Um, and on that note, you know, I thank you so much again, Sharon, and everybody who's joined in, um, taking us through this journey of, of your life and letting us see how you came where you came from and where where we're going and i, I really appreciate you and and everything that you've done for our field and for me personally thank you <laughs> thank you calusa